Good evening, everybody. Pashas Vayera. Tonight I want to speak about the philosophy of Saddam. Now, it might seem to you uh, strange to think that Saddam had a philosophy. But uh, I don't know if it's true that all evil has its justification. But uh, I think it uh, has to be understood that people tend to act in ways that things seem to be logical to them. And so clearly the Anshay Saddam, even they were guilty of tremendous evil. And as we know, the Medrash says that uh, somebody would come to town and the, the idea of uh, giving tzedakah was uh, totally uh, offensive to them. They were evil people. They were, lived in a great society of affluence. And the whole, as I said, the whole idea of tzedakah, of charity was something they considered to be evil. So one has to understand what that mindset is. We live in a world where it's difficult to understand what kavod is, what uh, honor is. I'll give you a, a small example. Not so, not so long ago, before the Second World War in England, before the advent of television, the news reader for the BBC would sit down behind his microphone wearing a tuxedo. Nobody could see him. The idea is something called covered at Sibo. The idea is that even though nobody can see me, I'm addressing a large public and therefore, and the halacha is actually if you get up and you stand and, you, and you're in a place where people, there's more than a minion, a minion or more people, you should stand if when you're saying a Devar Torah. Kavad Ideas which are very foreign to us today. Nowadays, if you walk into a super ex expensive restaurant, the guys wearing the tuxedos are serving the guys who got the torn jeans and the huge credit cards. <laughs> it's an, ant an anti-covered world. It's been turned upside down. I heard a story, Rav Palm, as the sake of Sadl Levracha, was driving in a car with a, a younger man, somebody in a kolo in, in a car in, in New York. And this younger man, this young fellow, this young yeshiva, this young kolo fellow wanted to overtake the, the bus. The bus had come to a, a halt. And Rav Palm says, no, you can't, you can't overtake him. Kovod Atzibo. The bus represents the public. And you stay, you stay behind. You don't overtake. Again, foreign ideas to us. We once discussed the whole idea of what is covered. Let's try and understand what covered is to kick off with. What is covered? What is honor? What is the feeling of covered? So we know, we said in the, in the beginning, in the, in the, in the fill in the morning, l'cha Hashem ha-gadula v'agavura v'atiferetz v'anetzach v'ahod, etc., Gedula, Gavura. Gedula represents Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu is the pillar of Chesed. Chesed is the idea in the mystical sense of his, hispashtus, of, of going out to the world, of spreading out. Avram Avinu went out to the world. He was Makari of hundreds and thousands, brought hundreds of thousands under the Tachas Kanfe Shechina, under the uh, wings of the Shechina, brought people to a belief in one God. He went out. Generosity, chesed. Chesed is always proactive, is always that midah which goes out of itself. The second midah is the midah of Gevura, which is the midah of Yitzhak Avinu. Yitzhak Avinu never left Eretz Yisrael. Yitzhak Avinu was the uh, essence of self-abnegation. That in a sense, the, the major says in a certain sense that the Arkadah, the, that, that in a certain sense that... Um, Yitzhak Avinu actually died on the Akeva, Akeda. And the Ofro Shel Yitzhak, the ashes of Yitzhak are Munach in front of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. He was the ultimate, so to speak, the other extreme of Chesed. Total inwardness, total... And of course, the, the opposite of Hispashtus going out is Tzimtum. Tzimtum, which is all co also connected, we talk about Pachad Yitzhak, is a fear. So the Mida of Avram Avinu is the, the Mida is the desire to connect. Yamin Makarov, a small docha, the right hand brings close and the left hand pushes away. Of course, that Kirov should always be 
The, I did, the desire to bring close should be stronger as the right hand is stronger than the left. But the synthesis of, this, of these two, of Avram Avinu, of Chesed, of the desire to be close, to go out, to be close, bring close, and Yitzhak Avinu, which is the fear to be close, the synthesis, synthesis of that is Yaakov Avinu, which is Torah, ain't covered ala Torah, it's covered. Covered is the synthesis of the desire to be close and the fear to be close simultaneously. For example, if let's say um, um, I remember many years ago Rav Dov Schwarzman Zechazad Lebrocha, who I was able to be close to in this, he, he turned up one day, there was a certain thing that was going on and he wanted to check out that everything was okay, and he turned up at my home. It's a Godel Batera of Aaron Cutler's son-in-law. Moshe Shapiro was, was maspid, gave a hespid to Rav Doiv, and his funeral and said there was never anybody like Rav Doiv, and never, never will be anybody like Rav Doiv again. That was Rav Moshe Shapiro speaking. He was Anak Sheba Anakim, a, a giant amongst the giants. And I remember he came one day to Shalashudas at my home on, on Shabbos afternoon. So the feeling that I had is what's called covered. The tremendous desire to be close, and at the same time, the fear of being close. The desire to be close and the fear of being close at the same time is what we call honor, covered. And that's something which is very much difficult for us to understand today. Now, the Midas work there all the way down to the lowest of the, of the Midot, of the Sfirot, which is Malchus. Malchus means kingship. In a sense, that is where covered monof- man- man- manifests itself in this word, world. Covered and Malchus are inextricably linked. When you see a king, whether it's a non-Jewish king or a Jewish king, the nusach of the bracha is slightly different, but you, you say, you praise the Kaddish Baruch Hu, she chalak michvodo lebosav adam, that he has a portion from his honor to flesh and blood. That's the bracha for a Jewish king, if I remember correctly. She, she nosan me, me kvodo, for a non-Jewish king. But the idea is the same. The idea is that the idea of, of malchus, of kingship, is the idea of kavod. Kavod is how kavod manifests itself in this world. The kavod that starts off, so to speak, with Yaakov Avinu, as it comes all the way down, all through the Sfirot, comes into this world. Of course, this world is the world of Malchus, the lowest of the spheres. And if you think about it, true kavod for Hashem has to come from the lowliest possible place. Because Covered is not something you can order up. Covered is not something you can order up like a takeaway dinner. You can't order somebody to give you honor. An honor which is ordered is the greatest lack of cover that can be. True covered has to come to from, from the place where it's possible for that cover to be withheld to the maximum degree, which is this world. This world is the greatest world of Hester, as the world's all chained down from the highest regions. The, 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 the presence of Hashem, the knowledge of Hashem, the, the Shekhinah becomes more and more difficult to find. To, the presence of the Shekhinah is more removed, is less accessible to us. And therefore, that's why the, the, this world is the world of Malchus, the lowest of the levels, where it's possible for us to give a cover to Hashem, which is not possible for any other being that exists in creation. Because this is the world of the, with the potential of the maximum e covered the maximum to withheld that covered and when that covered comes from the place where it's possible for it to be held withheld to the maximum degree then it's the greatest covered that can be Saddam was a society Let's, let's actually, just before we get to that, <clears throat> it 
Somebody who has a very low sense of his own kavod, self-respect, self-worth, you'll see always will attach himself to somebody he considers to be his, the most mechubadika person he can find. Reflected glory. This is like somebody who has little kavod, feels an upgrade when he's in the proximity, when he lives next, his next door neighbor is a pop star or a politician. Oh, you know something? I live next door to so-and-so. So what? But you see that a person derives, a person has to have covered. As we're saying, all expressions of covered ultimately are ultimately expressions of malchus, and I'll explain what this relationship is. Excuse me. So as we're saying, in most cases, what people regard as covered as being honorable is really based high on symbolism and low on content. The many of the sages and our, our teachers teach us that a person cannot exist without any covered whatsoever. The word covered is synonymous with nefesh. Nefesh is the life force. Nefesh is the lowest form of life. Laman, we said in the morning, Laman yizmercha kavod velo yedom. In order that Laman zmercha, kavod, the kavod should sing to you. Kavod here means the nefesh. If you take absolutely all honor away from somebody, he cannot live. Because why? It's like taking his nefesh away from him. It's taking like taking his life away from him. And it's interesting if you'll notice that when somebody loses all sense of their own honor, of their own kavod. There's a defense mechanism that kicks in and they have illusions, delusions. And their delusions are that they're somebody else. Now, their delusions are not that they are the local storekeeper. Their delusions are that they're Napoleon. The delusions are that they're the founder of Christianity. People who are depleted from all sense of self-worth, the last step before that kills them, because as we said, the nefesh is the covered. Take a cov- all covered away from people. And I think I'm right in saying this is what the Nazis, Yemach Shemom Vezichrom, were very intent and unfortunately, to a great extent, successful in removing all dignity, all covered from a human being. And people die from that. That's a killer. Because the nefesh is the covered. But what happens to people before they get to that extreme state is that they will start to believe that they are somebody else. And who do they believe they are? The most mechubadika person they can think of. That's where they take refuge. They think they're Napoleon, Julius Caesar. Everything Hashem created in this world was his, for his kavod. Man was created to reveal the kavod of Hashem. Therefore, it strips when man, sorry, it follows that if man is stripped of all kavod, since he, since he essentially was created to be in this lower world, the agency through which the kavod of Hashem is revealed, that is, is his life, when that is removed from him, as we said, necessarily, he can't live anymore. It takes away his soul, because for that reason, man was created. What is covered? The necessity of covered to be dignified, to be respectful, I know respectful is not right, but to be... Um, is, part of this is what we would call autonomy. A person who is totally dependent on somebody else has no covered. A slave, there's one opinion in the Gemara, we don't pass in like this, but there's one opinion in the Gemara that if you embarrass an Eved, a slave, there's no, you don't have to uh, re- recompense him. But the reason why there's the Havamina is because an Eved has so little self-determination. His life is not his own that at a certain basic level he lacks covered. 
So just as a king embodies the essence, the essence of kavod, an evad embodies the lack of kavod. Because when somebody's essential existence is dependent on somebody else, as that's the definition of a slave, he's bereft of kavod. And as we said before, without kavod, there's no existence. Saddam was, this was their philosophy to in extremis. A society which outlaws, why does a society outlaw tzedakah? Because they regarded the person who receives the, the tzedakah as pathetic, but they saw the giver of the tzedakah as a murderer. Why? Because when you remove the ability, you take away, when a person, you give a person tzedakah, you are taking away from his, him his kabod. They took that to the ultimate criminal extreme, extremity, which is they perceived that there was, this was a society where by giving tzedakah to people, you remove from them their life. You remove from them their kabod. That's why they outlawed tzedakah. Saddam insisted that every person had to live on his own merit. And if you couldn't sustain yourself, or if you sustained somebody else, that's an insult to the covet of humanity. The true covered, the true Malchus, is born in Saddam. How do we see this? It says, Pasik says, actually we're gonna need some some chumashim. There's a Gemara that says, Amar Rabbi Yitzhak, it says in Tehillim, Matzotzi David Avdi. Heichem Matzasiv, where did Hashem find, thank you, where did, where did Hashem find David Amelech? Where did he find, he found him in Sodom. Sodom, even though it had this distorted idea of the true nature of Kovod, and outlawed tzedakah because it understood that that took away the very essence of a person, the independence of a person, which is his tzuris Adam, which makes him dome to Hashem, that he's the master of himself, that he's a king, the king of, king of himself. But the Gemara tells us that Hashem found David HaMelech in Sodom. David HaMelech. David is the king. David represents Malchus in this world. What has David got to do with Saddam? How are the two connected? So let's turn to Parshas Vayera, Parshas of the the Week. It's at the beginning of Revi'i, the fourth Aliyah. If anybody finds it, please sing out the page number. Page 88. Okay, so now, this is after Lot has escaped. And look at 1924. Yutes Chaf Arba. Chaf Talad. So, Vashem Himte al Sodom, Vala Moira, Gofris Vaish, Me'es Hashem, 
מן השמיים, ויהפוך אס האורים או אל, ואס כל הכיכר, ואס כל יושבי האורים, וצמח האדמה. Translation. אנשים rain down on Sodom and Amora, fire and brimstone from Hashem, from the heavens. Now this is the posseg I really wanted. ויהפוך, note carefully these words. And he overturned, Hashem overturned, Esa Orim, the cities, Esa Orim Ha'el, these cities, Ves Kol Akika, and all the plain, Ves Kol Yoshve Ha'orim, and all the dwellers of these cities, Vetzemach Ha'odama, and the vegetation. Now, what they call this in English, when I was, we studied English literature at school, was something called Bathos. Not Pathos, but Bathos. Bathos is basically when you build something up very big and then pzz, you put a pin in it and the whole thing collapses. Look at this tremendous progression. And Hashem overturned the cities, these cities and all the plain and all the dwellers of the plain and the plants and the vegetation. Very strange. <laughs> what, is, what does this mean? It's one of these psukim that once you, you read it, you, right? There's a process in history called hippuch. Hippuch means reversal. That's the first word. Hippuch, lafoch, to turn over. This is a, um, I'll read you a translation of a Gemara. And Rabbi Yochanan says, the son of David, David HaMelech, who is the son of David, Mashiach, Ben David, will come only in a generation that is entirely innocent, in which case they will be deserving of redemption, or, of redemption, or in a generation that is entirely guilty in which case there will be no alternative to redemption. And then he brings Psukim. There are two ways Mashiach can come, either if we merit it or through a process of what's called Hippuch, a process by which things get to a point where they cannot get any worse. And then there's this process built into the world, which is called Hippuch, which flips everything to the other extreme. David is called Melech Israel. Melech. Melech Israel. He is the king. And where does he come from? As we read in this Posuk, where Heichen Matzati Sadom. What is the lineage of David and Melech? David and Melech, if you remember, after this the tragedy of Sodom, Lot and his two daughters were left alone. And his two daughters, one could really maybe conjure this up in one's minds, were existed in what probably Lo'aleinu Shem Yerachim was something like a post-nuclear war situation. There was nothing left. Everything was destroyed. Chazal teaches they understood that they were the only human beings left al- alive on the planet. And therefore, and the Torah ascribes no blame to this because they acted altruistically, they both decided that they would cohabit with their father and through that way they would preserve mankind. The elder of these two sons was called Moav, which literally means Me'av, from father, Moav. The gematria gematria of Moav is 49. 49 because Moab contains within it the Memtes Shari Tuma. There's a concept that there are 49 levels of impurity. Klal Israel, before they left Egypt, had sunk to the 49th level. There is no 50th level. There is no 50 in this world. The Maharal says in many places, seven is the natural world. We've mentioned this many times before. And if you want to extrapolate something to its maximum, you times it by itself. So the maximum of this world, there are seven... Seven notes in the diatonic scale, seven colors in the rainbow, seven days in the week in almost all cultures. Seven is this world. You want to make the maximum this world can contain, you times it by itself. Seven times seven is 49. That's why there are 49 days in the Omer, because 
We can't count the number 50. 50 is beyond, 50 is shvus. 50 is a connection to something beyond. And that's the Memte Shari Bina. That's the 49 levels of supernal wisdom. The other extreme is the 49 gates of Tuma, and those are all contained within Moav. And if you remember, it's the Benos Moav who are subsequently in the story of Klal Yisrael in the Torah will be the ones to be michshal, to trip out the Jewish people and create, and create a tremendous plague. If you remember, Bilam recommended to Bolak that he would be, should be machshil, he should, should trip the people up with his nus because their God hates nus. And the daughters of Moab, if you remember, Moab contains within it the 49 levels of impurity. And that's where David HaMelech comes from. David HaMelech comes from Moab. Let's do a little bit of history. Moab, if you remember, the great-granddaughter of Moab was going to become Rus. Rus who came under the Tachas HaShchina and eventually was the great-grandmother of David HaMelech. So basically we can trace, and that's what this Gemara says, where did Hashem find David HaMelech? In Sodom, in this incestuous union between Lot and one of his daughters, comes David Melech Israel, the king, the, 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 the essence of kingship. How do we understand this from such a place? In another place, it speaks about Avimelech as Achad Ha'am. The nature of a king is he has to be Meyached Ha'am, to unite the, the kingdom, to unite everything underneath him. David Melech has to, so to speak, relate to every single level of the people, of Ha'am from the very lowest to the very top, in order for him to be the king, the king. Now, I wanted to say, and we'll just make a small detour here, that apart from David HaMelech being David HaMelech, but David HaMelech was also Naim Zmiris Israel, which is very inadequately translated as the sweet singer of Israel. David HaMelech, as we know, was the figure who represents music. I once asked with Moshe Shapiro, what did the music of the Levian sound like in the Beis HaMikdosh? And he said, and he says it comes from Sfarim, that it probably sounded most like um, classical music. Because classical music finds its roots in the early plain chant, plain song of the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church, as we know, comes from a little bit of history. Let's go the other way around. When the Romans captured the Malchus, there's a concept that basically, let's go a bit further back, that we understand that Jewish people are going to go through four great historical exiles, four great kingdoms, each one of which snatches the kingship from the one before. Bovel, Babylon, the first of those, Malchus, of those kingdoms, wrests the Malchus from Klal Yisrael, then comes along Paras and Madai and snatches it from them. And then comes along Greece, who takes it away from Paros and Madai, Persia and Medea. And then comes Rome, who eventually takes it from Greece. And we are conceptually, spiritually, in that final exile. That exile goes on and on and on. It's based on a prophecy of Ovadia that says that, that uh, Yaakov Avinu was, had this dream of a ladder, and on this ladder... It's a medrash that says that the, the malachim were going up and down. Who were these malachim? They were the uh, controlling powers, the, the uh, malachim, the, um, the angels, I don't like that word, of four great kingdoms. There were four, uh, four, um, four um, exiles, four angels going up and down. The first one he saw going up and down was Bovel. Bovel went up 72 rungs, 72 years in exile in Bovel, and came down again. I think, sorry, 70. And then 52, Poros and Madai. 52 years in exile, the Jewish people were in the exile of Persian and Medea. came down again. Then 180 rungs it went up. That was the exile of Greece. It came down again. This is the dream of Jacob Avinu. And then Jacob Avinu saw this angel going up and up and up and up and up and didn't, didn't come down again. And he got very frightened. And Hashem said, Al-Tirah, Avdi Yaakov, don't fear my servant Jacob. 
even if you will imtagbir kanesha, even if you'll rise up like an eagle and make his nest amongst the stars, talking about Edom, I will bring him down from there. Rashi says, Edom is Rome. And Rome, with the conversion of the Caesar to being Christian, to a, being a Christian, becomes, quote-unquote, the Holy Roman Empire, which, if you remember, your history master probably taught you was neither Holy Roman nor an empire. <laughs> the Holy Roman Empire basically gives birth, so to speak, to, in the West, to the Catholic Church, in the East, the Orthodox Church, the Greek and the Russian Orthodox Church, and they basically beget the modern Western materialistic world that we live in today. So we are living in the exile to this day of Edom. The last of these kingships, the kingship of Edom, its symbol is the pig. Why is it the pig? So the pig, if you remember, Esau sticks his trotters out just to say, look, I'm kosher. I'm fine, I've got split hooves. The pig, the word in Hebrew for pig is chazir. And one of the more deep understandings of why it's called, why the semel, the sign of Esau, of Edom, of Rome, of the exile we're into this day, has the sign of the pig, is because he eventually will be machzir. Chazir is the same word as to be machzir, to return the kingship to Klal Israel. But we're still in that exile, and we're still waiting for that. So the Romans, along with taking the Malchus, they logically took all the trappings of kingship. And David HaMelech, who is the Melech, was also Naim Zmiris Israel. And so quite logically then, one can understand that the music of the Jewish music, we really want to know what Jewish music really sounded like. That's probably what it sounded like, because the Romans took into captivity not just the Malchus, they also took the music along with it. Now this idea we've been speaking out that a king has to be miyached, has to link together the highest, the bottom to the top. And that's why David Amalek has to come from the lowest possible point of Moab, Memtes Shari Tuma, the 49 gates of Tuma. I was thinking to myself that music itself embodies this idea of the connection to the top and the bottom. How? If you look at a scale, the word in Italian for a scale is scala. Scala, I mean the word scale comes from the, the, the Italian or the Latin scala. Scala means a ladder. No, a ladder always connects the top with the bottom. In fact, if you look at the scale, the scale gets to a point where it repeats itself, the bottom and the top. Music is a connection of the top and the bottom. It's a scale. No scale starts at the beginning and ends in the middle. It comes to a complete, a, 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 a complete, uh, how do you say, a place where it connects two extremities. If you also look at a note, if you pluck, let's say, a note on a string bass, which is because it's a low frequency, you'll see this very clearly. A note doesn't sound and then just go back to the middle. Every note, when you pluck it, is equally and opposite, moves around that middle point. If that's the, the spine, so to speak, the, the neck of the string bass, and you pluck it, it goes here, and it goes here. And the, d the degree that it goes to this way, it'll go that way. It's equal and opposite. It connects the top and the bottom. If you look at a, a note on a, an oscilloscope, you'll notice that the top of the sine wave is the same as the bottom. The essence of a note is connecting the top to the bottom. And the other aspect of music, which I want to say is connected to the connecting the top and the bottom, is to do with its emotion. There's a concept that music comes from the morah shchora. Now, the morah shchora we would translate in modern day terminology as depression. The ancients understood there were four morot, four humors. The black humor is depression. How can music come from? the Moresh Chora, because music has this incredible power to change a person's mood, to take a person who's in deep depression and to raise him up. How does it do that? Because music can say, I've been there. I come from that place of depression. That's why it has the ability, only a person, only in a, when, a, when somebody, God forbid, has a terrible tragedy, who is the person that can comfort that person? The person can say, I've been there. I know what you're feeling. Music says, I've been there. 
I come from the Moresh Chorah. I come from depression. I've been there. I can raise you up. Why am I saying all this? Because music emotionally is a connection of the top to the bottom. So we have David HaMelech, who is the king, who embodies music who embodies the scale, who embodies the note, who embodies the concept of music being able to connect the two extremities of emotion with the top and the bottom. That is what the Melech does. The Melech unifies everything. Let's go back to our Posuk now. He overturned the cities and the entire plain with all the inhabitants of the cities and the vegetation of the soil. Viafoch, as we said, believe, as we said before, the son of David, David and Melech, Mashiach can only come to a generation which is entirely Zakai or entirely guilty. How does David and Melech, how does Ben David, excuse me, come to a generation which is entirely guilty? Because there will be no alternative to accept redemption. Meaning, things get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse to a point that they cannot, they bang up against the end stop. 49, you get to the 49th level of Tuma and then something really strange happens. Just like the plane, just like this flipping over of Sodom. So everything flips over from minus 49 to plus 49. That is the process of hippuch. Now, now we can understand the end of this posuk. But tzemach ha'adoma. One of the names for Moshiach is the tzemach tzedek. Tzemach is the, the name of Moshiach. This is clearly hinting that this is the way Moshiach can come. That it gets to a point, just like Sodom, where the entire thing was flipped over. So the tzemach of David David ben, ben David, the Mashiach, will come in this process where things will just get to a point where they cannot get any worse. That is the concept of the Malchus uniting the lowest to the highest. That is why David has to come from Moab, from Memtes Shari Tuma. Because that is the... It speaks in the Svarim of Ichfasa the Mashiach, the birth pangs of Mashiach. What has the coming of Mashiach got to do? Thank you very much, by the way with a birth. I think we gave this marshal in previous year. Let's say you're a Martian. Now, of course, as a Martian, you have no idea how humans are born. Because as we all know, on Mars, all Martians are single cell, self-replicating organisms. And they just grow. And, you know, they're very happy about that, I'm sure. But they have no idea of what human birth is. Now, of course, in Mars, as we know, Mars is the where, place where they make the best telescopes in the universe. And there's this Martian telescope which is trained on the delivery room of Hadassah in Karim Hospital. And you, you're a Martian sitting there looking through this super powerful tele telescope. And you see this most terrible, terrible scene in the delivery room of Hadassah where there's this poor earthling female earthling, in the most terrible, terrible pain. And you have all these people, these earthling men, largely, standing around with stethoscopes around their necks and white coats on. And nobody seems to be do, doing anything. It's the greatest tragedy that's going on. And yet what? In a split second, that seeming tragedy gets flipped from the greatest disaster, the greatest sadness, to the greatest joy with the birth of another human. This is hippuch. This is a classic example of hippuch. Things can't get any worse. The most excruciating part of a birth, I'm, I'm not speaking from personal experience, but is the, the, the more it develops, the, the birth becomes, the more painful it becomes until the moment of release, wow. until the moment of birth. This is how Mashiach will come. Ein ben David, ein ben David ba ela bado shakula zakai o kula chayev. It will get worse and worse and worse and worse. And we see the world in a state of increasing materialism. 
breakdown of moral values. Things are considered to be commonplace, which in my day were considered to be obscenity. And things become to the point now where if you want to bring your children up with normal gender identification, you could be accused of, of uh, perverting them and not allowing them their freedom of expression. This is the norm. It gets to a point where things hit up against the end stop. And just like the hippoch of Saddam, where everything gets flipped over, so the world reaches, Ben David comes with this, this hippoch. The true covet of Hashem has to come from the lowest possible place. The mistake that they made in Sodom, why they banned Tzedakah, was they didn't understand that the principle of covet comes from the interface that in order to be able to, to reveal the covet of Hashem in the world, it's nothing to do with my covet. The person who gives is not a killer. The person who gives is a partnership in, in the covet of Hashem. And this can only be revealed in this world of the maximum e covet the maximum hest or the maximum hiddenness. I'll tell you two stories to finish with about COVID. Well, one's about COVID. Rav Chaim Shmulev is like Apparently, he struck up a friendship with one of the local, uh, uh, how do you say it, um, the garbage guys. How do you say it? The guys, who, the, 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 the garbage man, the guys who go around <laughs> on, on, on the bins, right? Yeah. So whatever, I don't know how they, but they, they struck up a friendship and, uh, and um, you know, in, on a garbage truck, there are the guys who stand on the back who, and there are the guys who do, right, who do the, and there are the guys who sit up in, in the cab, in the cab. And so one day, they, this, this, this garbage guy, he never, Chaim Shmulevitz had never actually met this fellow when he was on the job. He just, whatever, I don't know how they, maybe in Davening or something, and he mentioned that he worked for the sanitation. So uh, he met him, and this, he's, he's, they met, and, the, and this guy, this garbage guy, was standing on the back of the truck, and he was got off the back, and he started to, you know, put it into the, into the dumpster in the back of the truck. And he said to Rib Chaim, he says, the Rosh Shiva should know that usually I work up in the cab. This is fake covered. Wow. This is what we in this world so much of the time think that the covered that we can achieve by becoming famous, by becoming rich, that's just moving from the back of the truck into the cab. So what? <laughs> the true covered is when a person exemplifies, gives that, dedicates his covered that he has naturally as being attached as a representation, representation of the king. This is the only form of avdus where we actually personify the true covet of Hashem. This is the irony that an Evid has no covet because he is a, he's, he's, he's divorced of his, of his own identity. He becomes subsumed in the identity of his master. But when a Jew becomes an Eved Hashem, this is the greatest possible covered. And the last story I'll, I'll tell you about is the idea of, this idea of how a person can become a partner with Hashem in the sense that Hashem is the greatest giver because there's nothing we can give back to Hashem. If we were able to give back something to Hashem, this would mean 
that he didn't have that thing before, which means that before I gave him this thing, whatever it was, he was lacking in some way. And now I made Hashem more perfect. So axiomatically, that's important. That's impossible, excuse me, it's impossible. Because by definition, Hashem is that existence who is perfect in every single way. I can't give anything to Hashem. But when I'm, when I, so to speak, when I B'Tselem Elohim, when I act like Hashem, so this makes me a partner in Hashem, this makes me, to a certain extent, like Hashem. The independence... Let me give you, so I'll tell you this story. When a person, <clears throat> nobody likes to be a taker. Nobody likes to receive tzedakah. That's why the Ramchal calls it Nahamat Kisufa, the bread of shame. The bread of shame is when a pauper sticks out his hand and he doesn't want to receive. So in a sense, the Anshe Stom saw that. They saw that's the greatest bizoyan that a person is killing the covet of somebody else by giving. And nevertheless, we are enjoined by a Kodesh Baruch Hu to give. And the reason why, because we want to be B'Tzal Elohim, and in order for us to be able to give, there has to be the ability to take. So a person who takes should understand that he is facilitating the giving which makes the other person B'Tzal Elohim. If he does that, then he becomes a partner. All the system of this world is mashpia and mushpa, is the one who influences and the one who is influenced. It's a, it's a um, symbiotic relationship. It has to be like that. Giving cannot happen, happen unless taking also happens. But a person can make his giving a giving which is a giving in a, the best possible way. How does a person give in the best possible way? So I'll tell you a story I heard from my Rebbe. I don't know if it's a, a true story, but as uh, I think I've said this before, Rabbi Beryl Wine says, all my stories are true, just some of them haven't happened yet. <laughs> Meaning, okay, so here's the story. There was a Jew who found himself stranded in a non-Jewish city on Erev Shabbos. He went there to do business. And the last train pulls out, and he's, he's missed his train home. He's going to have to stand and spend Shabbos. So what does he do? He doesn't know anybody. So back in the day, I don't know if they still had them before, they were before cell phones and Google and whatever it was, he went into a phone booth. And of course, if you remember, do you remember phone booths? Do you still remember those? Yeah. In the phone booths, they have to have these four large directories, right? We should flip up. So it was, I think, A to C and D to F. <coughs> so he flips up A to C, goes C, C, O, C, O, H, E, Cohen. N. Cohen. Picks up, finds a number. <coughs> First Cohen on the list. Not too many of them. <coughs> he says, Mr. Cohen, you don't know me, but <coughs> I'm a Yid, and I'm stranded in this town. Can I come and spend Shabbos with you? So Mr. Cohen says, of course. Come over straight away. So he thinks, oh, Baruch Hashem. You know, Klal Yisrael. Mi kamoch am Yisrael. So he goes over there, Mr. Cohen shows him He's got a suite, bathroom on suite, and he takes him downstairs, and there's this big, hot, steaming, beautiful cholent bubbling away there on the grill, and he shows him the fridge, and there are all these kinds of Shabbos dainties in there. And, uh, and he said to him, and so Mr. Cohen, he says, you know, I really, I can't thank you enough for your hospitality. It's really, Mrs. Cohen said, oh yeah, one thing I forgot to tell you, it'll be $150 for Shabbos. <laughs> so he goes, Hundred fifty. He said, "But you said I could." He said, "Take, take it or leave it." So, what can he do? <laughs> so he thinks, so, "Okay, hundred and fifty dollars." He sits down. He has this big helping of chocolate. He then goes upstairs. He runs the shower. He has about a twenty-minute steaming hot shower. <laughs> he right. He gets to go, goes to shul. He finds this beautiful shul. He comes back. He has this. Beautiful Shabbos Suda night there, you know, with, helps himself to everything in the fridge without a second thought. 
Same thing the following morning, goes to Shul, beautiful davening, comes back, Shalashudas, Havdola. And he says, thank you very much to Mr. Cohen. It was very nice. Really had, it was a very beautiful, everything was very nice. So here's the $150. So Cohen looks at him and says, what's that? He says, you said it would cost me $150. He said, no, I only told you that so you'd relax and have a nice time. <laughs> That's a real giving. People, the nature of a person doesn't like to take. Don't like to take. Why? Because essentially, that's pogea in my own sense of my covered. In a sense, to that extent, Anshay Sodom were onto something. So when a person wants to give, he should give in the best possible way, which is why he should give in a way where the person feels he's not taking. And if you think about it, there's not time for now. This is really what the Ramchal explains, why a Kaddish Baruch Hu makes a system by which the goodness that Hashem wants to give by virtue of who He is, He wants to give us a matnas chinam. But if He would give us a matnas chinam, a free handout, then we would not be able to be, make that part of ourselves. It would be lacking in the giving, the giving would not be the best kind of giving. And, the, and of course, the Shem's giving has to be the best kind of giving. So he gives us the giving of this gift of life, of the uh, uh, opportunity to, to be attached to him, to be a ben olam haba. All of the things that Hashem gives us, he gives us in those, these things in a way which we earn them. Because when a person earns something, he's kona it. It becomes part of who he is. So we analyze tonight... The philosophy of Saddam, to a certain extent, of course, is a very small part of it. The idea of where they made a mistake by outlawing tzedakah, but what was behind that idea? The idea that it removes the covet from a person. And the covet of a person is his nefesh, is his soul. We talked about how David HaMelech, David HaMelech, the essence of covet, how he has to come from the least mechubedika place to unite the entire nation. And his connection to music, because in music, as we went off on a bit of a sidebar there, we see those elements of the connection of the top to the bottom. Okay, that's basically it.